Hello YouTube, how's everyone doing? It's Professional here. So today I wanted to make another GTA San Andreas lore video, and in this video we're going to be covering Sweet. Now the last time that I did a character analysis video was actually two years ago exactly, and that was on Dutch Vanderlyn in Red Dead Redemption 2, and it talked about whether he was a good person from the start who became bad, or did he just change over time. That video actually got a lot of attention, and if you guys enjoy these lore videos, please do drop a like, it does help the algorithm a lot, and I'll be sure to link that Dutch video at the end of this video, but in this video we're going to be covering the character of Sweet and we're going to be talking about exactly his personality and why he constantly argues with CJ and he just gives CJ crap a lot of times. Um, he feels ungrateful a lot and a lot of players they don't like his attitude. They don't like how he's constantly pissed off at CJ and in this video I'm not really going to be defending Sweet but instead what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be examining exactly why he feels the way he feels and trying to explain it to people so that they have a better understanding of it. I don't agree with Sweet personally but I will be trying to look at it from his perspective so I hope that you guys enjoy this video character analysis on Sweet. So throughout the story, Sweet just constantly gives Carl a hard time. And the first time that we see this is at his mother Beverly Johnson's funeral. Now, CJ has returned to Los Santos because, as I stated, his mother had been murdered. Now, the reason that Sweet is so pissed off at CJ is because CJ left Los Santos five years ago in 1987. And he left because his brother Brian Johnson died. Now, it's unknown exactly on how Brian Johnson died, but the only thing that's known about it is that he was with CJ at the time of his death, and Sweet blamed CJ for, for his death. I can't believe she gone, man. That's another funeral you ran away from, fool. Just like Brian's. Hey, she was my mama too. Not for the past five years she wasn't, nigga. <laughs> So CJ just couldn't handle it anymore, couldn't take all the gangs and all the stuff in Los Santos, just wanted to get away from it and wanted to start a new life in Liberty City. So he left. Now CJ does accept responsibility for Brian Johnson's death in the end of the line cutscene before he goes into Big Smoke's Crack Palace. Look, I know you down for this, but I gotta go in there alone. What? Smoke played me. Tan Penny played me. They played us all. Yeah, but you're right. I was a buster when my family needed me the most. Hey, I let Brian die, man. But the thing about it is that throughout the story, CJ goes to great lengths to try to help Grove Street, to try to make it up to his brother Sweet, to his sister Kendall, and to his friends Big Smoke and Ryder, who he doesn't know are going to actually betray him later on. Now, a lot of people, they get really mad at, at Sweet at near the end of the game. Because what happens is, Sweet does get captured, he does get arrested by the Balas because Big Smoke leads Sweet into a trap. He leads Sweet into a trap in the mission The Green Saber. Now, CJ doesn't want to leave Sweet, he stays there to protect Sweet, basically risking his life. Because CJ could have easily died here, and not only could he have easily died here, but when he gets arrested by the police, he would have been probably thrown in life for murder. Because all the Balas that he killed there at the same time. So he basically risks his life and his freedom in order to protect Sweet. Fortunately, and I mean this is this is a very weird fortunately, Tenpenny saves CJ, but it doesn't save CJ out of the goodness of his heart. He saves CJ because he wants to blackmail CJ into doing more things for him. So CJ does get spared from going to prison. Now at this point in the game, Sweet is basically in prison for the majority of the game. And what happens is we don't see him near the final until the final act of the game when he's released from prison because of Torino. Now at this time, CJ does some really crazy things in order to try to get Sweet out of prison. And he also goes to great lengths to try to make Big Smoke and Ryder pay for betraying Grove Street. And CJ does this by getting rid of the Loco Syndicate. CJ infiltrates them, he kills Jizzy, he tries to kill Torino, he and Woozy and Caesar wipe out the rest of the San Fierro Rifa at the docks, he kills T-Bone Mendez and Ryder, and not only that, he takes a car bomb, drives it into the San Fierro Rifa's crack factory, and blows it up. So he did do a service for Los Santos. He did do a service to get payback at Big Smoke and Ryder, but most importantly, by destroying this crack factory in San Fierro, CJ didn't get all the drugs off the streets in Los Santos, but he got rid of a lot of them. And this is exactly why Caesar says to him, Carl, you're a hero down in LS. Carl! You're a fucking hero down in that list. I just spoke to my cousin. Not with my people, I ain't. Shit's still fucked up. Man, I got homies I used to run with that turn they back on me over this. Yeah, well, what are you gonna do, huh? 
So at this point in the storyline, Carl gets a call from an unknown person, the person he's using a voice changer, but he tells him that he can get his brother Sweet out of prison. So Carl goes to this address, he goes to this ranch, and he finds out that this person is Torino. Now Torino survived, Carl at first is scared because he thinks that Torino's gonna try to kill him, because again, remember, Carl tried to kill Torino. But Torino explains to him that he was actually an undercover government agent. Now it's never cleared up exactly what agency Torino works for, but judging by the ridiculous jobs that he sends CJ on and just the way that he acts, he is most likely the CIA. But anyways, Torino makes Carl a deal and tells him that if he completes these ridiculous crazy jobs for him, he will get his brother Sweet out of his life sentence, so he'll get him out of prison. He'll be a free man again. And CJ, he does some really crazy things for Torino alone. You know, CJ has ris risks his life several times over, could have died so many different times. And what happens is, when CJ finally gets Sweet out of prison, when Torino does keep his word in the end, and finally does release Sweet from prison, Sweet is basically just ungrateful. He's just saying, oh, you did everything for yourself, you didn't do anything for the family, and just constantly talking crap to Carl, just being ungrateful. And this is the point in the game when a lot of people get really mad at Sweet. But I do think that it adds to Sweet's character, despite how, you know, people get pissed off. I got pissed off myself, don't get me wrong. But it does add to Sweet's character, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But when I was a kid and I was playing through this, you know, I didn't seem to understand Sweet's attitude at first. I was just getting pissed off, and I was just saying, you know, Carl does some really crazy things. I was playing as Carl here, so I see what Carl's going through, and risking his life several times over only for this guy to just be totally ungrateful and just, you know, mouthing off at him, just being an ungrateful, excuse my language, asshole. Pretty much what he was. I'm not the only one who actually feels this way. I saw this video um, a year ago from this one channel called Hugo1, which I'll link the channel down below. He made a really great video, which you guys gotta check out, and that video is called Why Sweet is Garbage. And in that video, he explains basically all the ridiculous things that Carl does, and just the fact that Sweet is just ungrateful and doesn't help him out. I highly suggest that you guys check out his video. It's a really great video. But anyways, on to Sweet. So, Basically, what Carl does for Torino alone, let's let's talk about the ridiculous things that Carl does. Okay, so here we go. Carl, for Torino, um, he does that monster truck race, which, you know, is a little bit challenging at first, but it doesn't put his life in danger. Then what he does, you know, the first big job for Torino, he goes in the middle of the desert where, you know, some packages are supposed to be dropped, and then he starts taking out some, you know, rival spy agents or some corrupt government agents in helicopters trying to kill him. Then he has to pick up this drop avoid the police. Then, Carl actually has to buy an airfield for Torino, so he has to spend a ton of money, thousands of dollars, to buy this airfield for Torino, learn how to fly, which, you know, Carl, you know, never learned how to fly, he has to do it all from a TV, risking his life a bunch of times, but then when he finally gets all that done, he does this one mission for Torino, no, in which he actually flies all the way across the map, he has to fly low radar, it's meaning he has to fly near the ground, not even flying up high, flying all the way near these trees, almost crashing, almost dying, making this drop, then flying back. Then, Carl, what he has to do is this corrupt government agency that's a rival to Torino lands, starts stealing stuff from the airstrip, Carl takes the motorcycle, jumps onto the plane, fights these corrupt government agents, and then detonates um, a, a satchel charge, jumping off the plane, blowing up the plane in midair. But, guess what? Despite that crazy nonsense, it doesn't even end there. Torino... In his final mission, Torino tells Carl that he wants him to steal a fighter jet, a Hydra fighter jet, off of a government carrier. So Carl has to swim into a carrier ship, fight his way through a bunch of soldiers, steal a fighter jet, and then when he steals the fighter jet, he has to blow up spy ships. But it actually gets worse because Carl has to dogfight a bunch of fighter jets. So he has to shoot down three other fighter jets and then blow up the spy ships and then land the jet. Carl does all of that. All of those crazy things, Torino in the end does keep his word, and that's what I love about Torino. You know, despite Torino sending Carl on some crazy, insane things, at least he keeps his word, and that's what I love about Torino. But in the end, Sweet does get released from prison. And going back to my original point, this is the point in the game when people get really pissed off at Sweet. They get really annoyed at him. Let's play that infamous cutscene where people get really pissed off at him. What's up, bruh? Hey, what's up, man? How you doing, bro? I'm all right, man. Hey, man, we off to our new spot. We got a mansion, sweet. We've been putting in work, and shit is going well. We got a stake in the casino. We got some insane shit in Fierro. We getting into the rap game. 
Hey, man, let me get you some new clothes. Come on. New clothes? Nigga, what the fuck is this bullshit? What you mean, man? What's mine is yours, and you know that. You never did get it, did you, Carl? I need to go check on things in the hood. Man, that's the problem. You always a perpetrator, running from what's real. Hey, man, shit's fucked up there. You don't want to be in the hood? No, that's exactly where I want to be. What you done for our hood? Man, what the hood done for me? Always dragging me down. Ever since I got out the hood, shit been cracking. That's everybody dream to get out the hood. Man, you sound just like smoke right now. All right, man. You hard. I'm gonna show you what's going on in the hood. So that's the cutscene that a lot of people get mad at Sweet for, and a lot of people don't seem to understand this. And like I said earlier, when I was a kid and I played this, I didn't understand this at first, and I don't agree with Sweet personally, but I somewhat understand his perspective. And what perspective is there? Why does Sweet refuse to leave the hood? Why won't he leave it? You know, there are much better places to live. You know, CJ has is lives in Mad Dog's mansion with Kendall. A much better place, you know. Who would want to not live in a mansion, you know? CJ owns part share in a casino. He has a garage in San Fierro. You know, by this time, CJ has hundreds of thousands of dollars. He could easily afford, you know, Kendall and Sweet, nice homes in much better areas. But why does Sweet just insist on going back to the hood? Why is that? Well, I'll tell you this. There are people like Sweet all over the world. This is not just exclusive to America. There's people with this exact same attitude all over the world. And what I mean by this is Sweet comes from this basically old school mindset. And this really old school mindset is basically we grow up in an, we grow up in an area, we die in an area. No matter how poor the area is, no matter how bad the area is, no matter how dangerous the area is, we're born here, we live our lives here, we die here. It's a very old school mentality. And you can hear Sweet actually confirms this. Listen to what he says to CJ here when CJ actually tells him that the world is bigger than this hood. Was back on the map. Hold up, don't you think we ought to take it easy? What? You know, I got other things in mind. Commitments I made. Can y'all step outside for a minute? I need to talk to him. If you don't get this shit together, what you think this place gonna look like? You always did real good leaving jobs half finished. That's cold, sweet. Man, we can't take care of this from no bitch ass rapper's mansion. Look, the world's bigger than this hood. This is where our lives begin and where it's probably gonna end. And don't forget where you came from, Mr. Uppity-ass nigga. Now that ain't fair. Oh. Somebody just crossed out all the writing on the wall, disrespected your hood, and you act like you don't give a fuck. That ain't fair. Okay. Have it your way. Come on. So that is a great cutscene because it explains Sweet's character backstory really well. Even though it's near the end of the game, it explains his perspective pretty well. And we can tell from the cutscene that CJ is unhappy. He's in total disagreement with Sweet, but despite that, he still goes along with it because he wants to make his older brother proud of him. That's basically what why CJ does this stuff, because he wants his older brother to have his approval. And also partially because... CJ blames himself for Brian's death, so he feels like he has an obligation to his brother, he feels like he has to make it up to him and make it right, even if he's in total disagreement with what his brother is saying. And here's the thing, with going back to Sweet, there are people like him all over the world, and I know this for a fact, so let me explain. Most of my family is from Poland, and, you know, today, it's still a problem. Today, you know, living standards are much better than they were decades ago, but in Poland, and this is like, you know, a country in another continent, this is very far from, you know, Los Angeles in 1992, which San Andreas is supposed to be based on, but in Poland, there were, you know, these really poor villages, and a lot of these villages, they still exist today, but these really poor villages where people live in absolute poverty, just really poor, and there's almost no opportunity in these villages. There's there's no opportunity for, you know, to do something with your life in the future. You you live on the streets, or you're just basically a peasant worker on one of these farms. It's just not a great life. And what happens is pe a lot of people that grow up in these villages, they have the exact same attitude as sweet. They basically see it as, you know, we grow up in the village, we live in the village, we die in the village. We don't go anywhere else. 
And the, the reason that this mindset develops over time is because it, it's passed down from generation to generation. Some generations, they'll be able to see through this and say, wait, this is not right. But others, they're almost in a way kind of like brainwashed into it. They're basically taught from birth that this is the way to feel. And there's no other, there's no other, almost like there's no other world outside of the village or outside of the hood. And that probably has happened to Sweet. Because if you think about it, you know, Carl's mother, she's from this area. She is from Grove Street. She grew up here. And her parents, you know, CJ's grandparents, they probably also lived here. And, you know, we don't know, you know, how far back, you know, they came in here. But the point that I'm making is this this is happens over generations. Where generations over generations, they'll live in this one area and they'll develop almost like a, a sense of loyalty to that area. Um, an extreme sense of loyalty. They feel absolutely attached to that area. Even if that area is a really bad place to live. Even if there's poverty, there's no opportunity, there's crime, it's dangerous. They still feel an obligation to that area. They feel loyalty to that area. And what happens is, if somebody tries to leave the area, they try to move out of the area, you know, they're not going to stop you. You know, people like Sweet, they're not going to stop you. They're not going to tell you no. But they will show you mass disapproval. They will not agree at all. And if you leave the area, they'll see you as almost like a traitor. And this exact same thing has happened to people in the villages in Poland. They leave the villages, they go to cities looking for a better life, for better opportunity. And then one day, you know, they'll come back, they'll visit to see, you know, their past friends and family members. And what happens is the people in the village, they act like those people are like a traitor or something because they left, they abandoned the village. And we see that exact same mentality here with Sweet. When Carl, you know, he left to go to Liberty City, he came back five years later, and Sweet sees him as almost like, oh, you, you left the Grove. I wouldn't say that Sweet sees him as like a traitor, but he does have massive disappointment in him. You know, he feels like Carl has completely abandoned Grove Street. He feels like Carl has abandoned the hood. And to some extent, we can understand Sweet's perspective, because... Brian died when he was along with Carl, and at the same time is, you know, Carl was late for his mother's funeral. So to some extent, we can see Sweet's perspective. But in the end, Sweet is just extremely unreasonable, because Kendall most likely had the exact same attitude as him. She most likely had that same attitude. But what changed Kendall's mind in the end? It was actually meeting Caesar. When she met Caesar, she fell in love with Caesar. And Caesar was an outsider. He was not from the Grove area. He was not from the same neighborhood that CJ grew up in. And that's the exact reason on why Sweet shows massive disapproval for it. Listen to what he says about Caesar here early in the game. I'm tired of you not listening to me, girl. And I'm tired of you acting like you own me. I can see who I want to see. It just ain't right you seeing some cello motherfucker. Oh. Oh, what? A no good, narrow minded, hypocrite gangbanger telling me what is right and what is wrong? Let me guess, sweet. Sisless killing right, but a boyfriend from the South Side wrong? Some things ain't just meant to happen. I mean, what if y'all have kids? Leroy Hernandez? That don't sound His good, girl. His name ain't Hernandez. Well, Leroy Lopez did. Lopez either, you racist fuck. That ain't how moms raised us. I ain't racist, I just know how they feel about you. And look at you. You dress like a hooker. So as you guys can see right there, Sweet does not approve at all of Caesar, but I doubt that he even met Caesar um, before this cutscene. That's the only thing that he knows is that Caesar is just not from the same neighborhood, and because of that, he shows immediate disapproval. Carl is kind of skeptical at first, but then you know when he meets Caesar, he gets to know him. He sees you know my sister is really happy with this guy. You know he doesn't abuse her. He's a nice guy. He's also my friend. You know they're good for each other. She's happy. That's what matters the most. But Sweet, the way that he sees it, Caesar is an outsider. Kendall saw the bigger world when she met Caesar. And on top of that, Caesar also saved her life. He saved her life when he got her away from the drug dealers right after Carl was exiled from Los Santos. Now, this is probably the exact reason on why, um, on why Sweet actually says to Carl in the second to last mission, Los Desperados, the only thing that your brother wants you to do is to pay back your debts. You guys, hombre, it's time you help me and my homies. My hood's screwed up too. We got this shitty neighborhood on lockdown now. All right, what you need? It's time to get my old gang back together. Push out those yay slanging punks, eh? I know, but I got a lot going on right here in my own hood, man. And I made my brother promise. All your brother wants you to do is pay back your debt, CJ. All right, I hear you. I got your back. Come on, let's roll. Orale, the video's coming back. The reason that he, he tells Carl to go and help Caesar is because S Sweet, despite how ignorant he is, he does 
understand to a point that Caesar did save Kendall. If Caesar did not get Kendall out of Los Santos, she might have been murdered. So Caesar has protected her this entire time, as well as Carl and a bunch of other friends. So it's just not everything about the hood. Now, there are some times in the story in which Sweet's ignorance is just through the roof, and he's way out of line. And a perfect example of this can be near the end of the game, in one cutscene in which basically CJ says he knows that he went through a lot for this family, which he basically did, like I explained to you guys earlier. But Sweet, on the other hand, basically says, no, you did everything for yourself, and then goes on to saying that when Kendall needed shoes, I went and got the money, and when moms needed an operation, I went and I robbed people. But apparently, CJ, you know, doing all those crazy things to get him out of prison, you know, all those crazy government jobs for Torino, and on top of that, also protecting Kendall, protecting her from the drug dealers, and, you know, trying to provide a better life for his family, apparently that's not good enough, and apparently in Sweet's eyes, that's everything, um, Carl doing it all for himself. And, you know, he talks about needing money, he went, he goes and gets money for Kendall, he goes and gets money for, for his mom, but now CJ is a millionaire, so they don't ever have to do any of that again. They don't ha ever have to live that life of crime. They can live a comfortable, relaxable life without any of this. But Sweet, on the other hand, is just so attached to, to Grove Street. He's just so attached to it, he refuses to let it go. It just basically consumes him. He sees no other life whatsoever. So even when CJ is completely successful, he says nope. Now the other instance, and this is the one that pisses me off the most about him. Man, that's the problem. You always a perpetrator, running from what's real. Hey man, shit's fucked up there. You don't want to be in the hood. No, that's exactly where I want to be. What you done for our hood? Man, what the hood done for me? Always dragging me down. Ever since I got out the hood, shit been cracking. That's everybody's dream to get out the hood. Man, you sound just like smoke right now. Now this scene personally pisses me off the most because how dare he? There is no comparison whatsoever when he says you sound just like smoke right now. There's no comparison in that. None. And I'll explain. And the reason that Carl doesn't say anything back to him is because, like I said, he just wants his brother's love. He just wants his brother's approval. He wants his brother to support him. So that's why Carl tries not to argue with him. But when he basically says to him, you sound just like smoke right now, not a comparison. And I'll explain why. Carl basically says that it's everybody's dream to get out of the hood, you know, and he says, you know, what has the hood done for me? There's nothing wrong with being proud of where you come from, because Sweet says, don't forget where you're from. There's nothing wrong with being proud of where you're from, but it shouldn't hold you back and dictate to you where you can live, what you can do with your life. There's a lot of people that are proud from where they came from, but it shouldn't be everything that dominates their life. And if they grow up in a poor area, if they grow up in an area that's not so great, and they want to go and live in a better area, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't mean that they should forget their past or not be proud of it. But Sweet, on the other hand, he wants everything to just be absolutely positive. And when he compares CJ to Big Smoke, this is completely crossing the line. Because CJ had to flee Los Santos. He had no choice. The drug dealers were going to kill him and Kendall. There was nothing he could do. This is at the exact same time in which Sweet was actually in prison. And CJ was actually taken against his will by Tenpenny out of the city, so he had no way back into the city at the moment. CJ then plots to get back at Big Smoke, gets rid of the local syndicate, but he does really well for himself and becomes a millionaire. He does really well and just does not have to live in that life. Big Smoke, on the other hand, has betrayed all of his friends. He betrayed all of his friends. He betrayed Sweet. He betrayed CJ. He betrayed the rest of Grove Street. He worked with Ryder, who was a traitor with him. But the point that I'm making is that Big Smoke did everything for self-interest. He did it for himself. Big Smoke was selfish. He wanted to make a ton of money. He wanted to become this rich, mega, big crack dealer and decide to screw everyone over that he grew up with. Big Smoke's a, a terrible person in general. CJ left the hood because he had no choice. Big Smoke never left the hood. He did change the neighborhood that he was in, but he still had vast control of the hood. Big Smoke exploited the hood. He took advantage of the hood and flooded it with drugs to make money. CJ did not exploit the hood. He didn't take advantage of it to make money any way possible. So this comparison that he sounds just like Smoke, it's, just, it's not a comparison at all. It's just not. And there's also the issue of Big Smoke and Ryder. Now, Sweet is partially at fault for not seeing this happening earlier. There's nothing he could have done about Big Smoke's betrayal, because Big Smoke was just focused on the crack business. He wanted to flood the streets with crack, so his betrayal was eventually going to happen. However, though, Sweet could have seen this coming, 
And the reason I say this is because there have been several instances in the story in which Big Smoke actually questioned Sweet's leadership, but Sweet did not see this coming at all. So let me play three segments for you guys in which Big Smoke actually questioned Sweet's leadership. Baby needs diapers! Oh, shit. Hey, fool, we losing the streets, man. Nah, we are standing by our principles, homie. But our principles are making us bitches, man. Every day, ballers get stronger, and you and I get weaker. You and I get poorer, man. Man, that shit'll blow over. Oh, it whatever, always man. does. <laughs> get your... This ain't a fucking playground craze, man. This is the biggest money-making opportunity that guys like us will ever see. I got all the shit I need. Man, I thought we was in this for the hood. Not destroying the family, man. It's Grove Street, <laughs> nigga. Talk hey, you gotta keep it real, man. Man, nobody give a shit about the hood. I do. All they do is sell gay and ruin the place. No crack ever made a gang type. I don't know, man. What's up, y'all? What's up, CJ? What's crack? Man, all they care about is smoking and money. You can't knock the homies hustle, sweet. Them marks ain't soldiers. They idiots trying to be businessmen. Yeah, but they down with us, man. All they down with is money. CJ, go down there and show these fools you mean business. These chumps from the balls are sweating the homies. Go put pressure on us. Do it. We've been putting time in the hood, but we got to get the homies back together. Like the old days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you right. So you and Ryder gonna handle your business. Man, they're slang to their own mama. They don't care about nothing. You're naive, my friend. We got to keep our focus. What's happening with you, Ryder? Respect has to be earned, sweet. Just like money. So what you saying? You don't respect me? What I'm saying is... Speak up, nigga. I'M HUNGRY! Ah, oh, man, <laughs> shit. Hey. So in those instances right there, you guys can see there's three separate occasions in which Big Smoke questions Sweet's leadership. Now, Carl has been away for some time, so he probably would not have seen this coming, as I discussed in my video, Top 5 Hidden Signs, that Big Smoke was going to betray CJ. However, though, Sweet being so long with Big Smoke and Ryder should have seen something as well. For Ryder, it was pretty difficult to see that he was a traitor because there was no signs. And I know a lot of people were telling me that Ryder was not originally meant to be a traitor, but I'm just basing this on what the final version of the game was, which is that Ryder was a traitor along with Big Smoke. With Big Smoke, there were several several signs that he was going to betray Grove Street, and the biggest sign was constantly trying to push crack cocaine. Now, despite the bad things that I talked about Sweet, one of the good things about him, and one thing that I do admire and I respect about him, is that he is honorable. He is honorable in it that he's completely against drugs. He's completely against crack. He does not want crack on the streets of Los Santos at all. And the reason he doesn't want crack is because all it does is it destroys the hood. It destroys everything. It causes so many problems. And Sweet is 100% right on that. Big Smoke doesn't see it that way. And he constantly argues on trying to push crack. And you would think that with your second in command constantly taking the same position as your enemies, the Balas, you would get suspicious of that. But because of Sweet's logic, because of his, his views, he's been with Big Smoke and Ryder for so long. And five years ago, CJ just up and left and went to Liberty City. In that time, Big Smoke and Ryder, they stood with C with Sweet. And Sweet, I guarantee you, he has more faith in Big Smoke and Ryder. It's not that he doesn't trust CJ, but it's just that he has way more faith in Big Smoke and Ryder, at least in the beginning of the game. And because of that, it goes to his head, and he thinks, no, Big Smoke, Big Smoke would never betray me. He would never do that, no matter how many disagreements with ha we have. So, in other words, you know, Big Smoke basically played on Sweet. He played him. And the thing about it is that in the mission, in the mission re reuniting the families, Sweet says that he wants to get all the other families together and he wants to basically tell them to keep crack off of the streets. And all of a sudden, Big Smoke is in full agreement and says, if Sweet thinks he can do it, I'm with him. This is really suspicious because throughout the story, Big Smoke's arguing with Sweet, telling him that he should start selling crack. And then all of a sudden, Sweet just says, you know, we should tell them to get that stuff off our streets. And then Big Smoke's in full agreement. It's just really suspicious. So I think that Sweet should have seen this coming. He let Big Smoke play him. But there's one final thing that I want to cover about Sweet. And that is that he's a major hypocrite as well. Take a listen to this in the introduction. Hey Jeffrey, go to college, man. Make something of yourself. Me and a fat man, we mess our lives up. 
We fucked up in the game, man. We products of the environment. Don't be an idiot, man. Make us proud. Do shit different, baby. What am I so as you guys can see right there, Sweet is a massive hypocrite because he applies a very different double standard to both Jeffrey and CJ. So why does he admit to Jeffrey that his life is a failure, that both him and Big Smoke have messed up? He tells Jeffrey to go to college to try to make something of himself, to try to get a better life get out of the neighborhood but then at the same time is when cj tries to get out of the neighborhood tries to be successful he gets all pissed off at him why i think the reason for this is i think that jeffrey is not really a grove street member he lives in grove street don't get me wrong but he's not really a member of grove street when you think about it he's kind of a weakling when you think about it you know he might be muscular and all but he's not tough in the mind like sweet and big smoke and rider and cj he's just not tough like them he can't handle the gang lifestyle and sweet knows this very well so i think that's why he applies his double standard where he tells jeffrey you know get out of here go do something with your life but then at the same time it's kind of really hypocritical in how he gets all pissed off at cj because basically in his eyes as you know his his family, you know, his direct friends, his close friends, they have to all be here in Grove Street, you know, they have to be helping out the gang, they have to be helping out the hood, and if they're not, they're, you know, they kind of abandoned him, they abandoned the hood, they forgot all about it, he loses faith in them, but then he pushes Jeffrey to do something else with his life, and Jeffrey, you know, in the end, he does turn out to be a scumbag as well, because he betrays both CJ and Sweet also, he sells them out to Big Smoke. In the end, I don't think that Sweet is a bad person. He's a gangster, don't get me wrong, he's not a really good person, but he's not a bad person like Big Smoke or Ryder, and the reason is, is because... Like I was saying earlier, he is honorable, he's against drugs, and his best trait out of all of them is that he's uncorruptible. Somebody like Sweet cannot be corrupted. You could offer Sweet all of the money in the world and he would never betray his friends or family. He just wouldn't. And those are things that I admire about him. Those are things that I like about him. But some of the other stuff with him, with just how ignorant he is, how he's so against anybody leaving the hood he considers people that leave the hood almost like a traitor in a way the way that he lashes out at cj when cj has done so much for the family and the fact that cj just tries to provide him and his sister a better life and he sees cj as just running away from what's real whatever that's supposed to mean but the thing is is sweet i don't think he'll ever truly change his mind we don't know what happens after the events of san andreas but I don't think he ever changes his mind. I do think he has a higher opinion of CJ when the storyline ends, but when the storyline ends, I highly doubt that CJ would want to live in the hood. He would want to live in a mansion somewhere, you know, possibly in Vinewood Hills, some big mansion in San Fierro, or even a big mansion in Las Venturas. That's probably where CJ would want to live in the end, and Kendo would also want to live in a mansion. I think that the developers did miss one opportunity in the story. The story in San Andreas is perfect, don't get me wrong, but I wish that there was one cutscene in the game where they could have had Kendall come in as Sweet was just yelling at Carl, and Kendall could have gotten in Sweet's face and just said all the things that Sweet that CJ did to protect me, all the things that Caesar did to protect me. You can't constantly act like this. If Kendall actually lashed out at Sweet the same way that Sweet lashed out at CJ, I guarantee you he would have had a different reaction. Now, Caesar, if Caesar, you know, lashed out at him, it wouldn't have changed anything. It wouldn't change his mind at all. But if Kendall said something to his face and just said how ignorant he was, that might have actually changed something in him. And I'm really curious how that would have turned out. Maybe something like that does happen after the end of the San Andreas storyline. But we're never going to truly know. And from the storyline, we also see, you know, how he feels about Kendall not wanting to return to the hood. Here's what he says about Kendall. All right, man, let's get out of here and go see Kendall. Kendall can come see me right here at her home. But it ain't nothing here no more. Rome wasn't built in a day, nigga. My brother could be a real pain in the ass. So he says Kendall can come visit me right here in her home, but, you know, Kendall prefers Mad Dog's Mansion. You can't really blame her for not wanting to come back here. Yes, she does appear at the end of the game. They all appear. They're hanging out at, at CJ's house. But I highly doubt that Kendall would want to still live in the hood. And the very last time that we see Sweet, in the very final cutscene in the game, when all the friends and family are together at CJ's house, what is the last thing that Sweet actually says? What is it? This is what he says. Anyway, what's next? We should hit the casinos, roll some dice with Woozy. Nah, we gotta take care of shit here first. We going... He says, no, we have to take care of things here first. 
we have to take care of things here first. When they just got rid of Big Smoke, they just got rid of Tenpenny, they got rid of the Balas. They... So I don't know, you know, what else there is to take care of because I don't think that's that for Sweet. I don't think it's ever over. I think that when he says we gotta take care of things here first, I think what he's really saying is we gotta basically stay here and keep doing things in the hood forever. That's his attitude and it reflects perfectly at the end of the game. But let me know what you guys think down below. I hope that you guys enjoyed this character analysis video. I do like doing videos like this for you guys and I actually have a few more San Andreas videos still coming up. So if you guys enjoyed this video, do drop a like. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys on the next one. Take care everyone.